bring you guys an emergency braking Kilauea update. Today on Tuesday, August 24th, 2021, uh, there's been a significant swarm of earthquakes underneath Kilauea summit. And the USGS has issued a couple of statements uh, indicating that this suggests an intrusion of magma underneath the South Caldera area. There's no lava at the surface, but we're, we'll share with you guys this most current monitoring signals, the earthquake patterns, and we'll talk about some, some of your questions of what's happening with this uh, new burst of activity on Kilauea Volcano today. So you guys are looking at the iris animation um, of the earthquakes over the last 24 hours. It was actually fairly quiet for the 12 hours before that, only a few earthquakes before the swarm comes in in the southern part of the caldera over here. We're zoomed into it. Here it comes right through there. So this is close to that area of the south seismic southwest rift, that southwest rift connector. We'll talk about that here in, in a little bit. But that's the pattern over the last 24 hours or so. Let me zoom it out a bit so you guys can see this histogram for the last 24 hours on the right. You can really see how there's only a few events and then it really ramps up here uh, starting around 4.30 p.m. yesterday, August 23rd. And uh, just to show you guys that there's no lava at the surface, uh, this is a, the most current thermal image from the HVO webcam. And temperatures haven't changed. These hot spots you see uh, here are the regular chimneys for the heat that's escaping from within that hot, cooling lava lake that's still liquid on the interior and crusted over on the edges there. So no change on the surface there. Uh, not, that's not the only webcam, but we'll start with that one for now. Here's an earthquake pattern uh, on a current earthquakes map. You can see here, really, the southern area almost in a line, almost a linear, linearly kind of coming off to the south here. And right? from the area where the current lava lake is actually cooling, being right in there. So not really centered so much around there. Um, the west vent area is, was, is around here, so maybe a little bit of earthquakes around there, but really most of the activity, by and large, is here to the south and the southern edge of the caldera. This is all within Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, away from any infrastructure, away from people, and no threat to people as a result of this eruption. So we can just keep our scientific curiosity here um, without worrying about uh, as much human impact. Of course, if magma does uh, burst to the surface and cause an eruption, there will be gas as a possible impact. but. Right now, there's not even that to worry about, to be honest. So, um, let's see here. Why is it not showing all my earthquakes? Let's zoom out for you guys to see here this pattern on a, on a grander scale, mostly around Kilauea Summit here. Not any activity on this uh, upper East Rift zone, uh, East Rift connector at all. Um, and a little bit on the south flank, but that's similar to that. Uh, call it background level of steady activity we've had for many months now on that south flank. So really it's it's withdrawn from before uh, extending out to these edges to really going to the southern part of the caldera here. And that's what's happening now. So if we look at, let's see if I can get some of these earthquakes to come up. Maybe I need to reload it. I'm looking for my list to show up here on the left. Oh, there it is. So we can see that the most recent event here, 9.14 a.m., just 20 minutes ago or so, and before that it was 9.08 a.m., before that 9 a.m., 8.54, 8.46. So this is an ongoing uh, developing situation still. These are not happening at an alarming rate. The most recent one was at 2.5. There it is, right there. Um, and the largest event in the sequence has been at 3.3. And you can see there's a few twos in here, a 2.6, a 2.3. Um, but by and large, most of those are less than magnitude 2 and, and magnitude 1. There's another 2.0, 2.4. There's a handful in there. And if I come up here and I sort this by largest magnitude first, it's listed, listed as a 3.4 here. Maybe it's been revised, and that's more underneath this, this uh, summit area close to the west event right there, the 3.4. And that's the one that we, that we maybe can see registering some of the tilt meters nearby, which is something that, that we'll look at here shortly as well. All right, so let's move on from these earthquake patterns for now. We'll come back when we have questions and look at the USGS statement here. The first statement was issued earlier this morning, and uh, it said that uh, through 2.30 a.m. there had been over 100 earthquakes. Um, a second statement was put out a few hours later, and that one says that by 4.30 a.m. there had been over 140 earthquakes. They state the largest recorded 3.3, majority less in magnitude 1. 
Um, small earthquakes are continuing at a rate of about 10 or at least 10 detected earthquakes per hour here. Right, so this actually begins around 4.30 p.m. August 23rd yesterday um, at lower levels, continuing through the night and uh, intensified at 1.30 a.m. Um, and as they state here, this activity may indicate an intrusion of magma occurring 1 to 2 kilometers, 0 0.6 to 1.2 miles be beneath the south caldera. So that's the current prognosis here, is that there's an intrusion of magma, and um, there was a, a increase in the style of ground formation recorded by the sandhill tilt meter, especially it's called out here in this, in this update, just to the west. The same tilt increase was recorded by the tilt meter near Uwekahuna Bluff, the site of the OHVL building. So we'll look at that a little bit shortly here as well. But just so you have an idea what this looks like, since we've looked at some of these seismographs before, um, here is a station at Uekahuna showing all these blue ink splotches here on this record as different small earthquakes occurring. So you can see that in this upper part of the, the plot here, there's, they're occurring, but at a lower rate, there's less of them. And here's where it really picks up uh, yesterday and this morning right here. So this is kind of on the north edge of the caldera, so maybe not the most telling station. You can't see any tremor really through here. Um, you see similar patterns on other stations around the north part of the caldera here. But if we move further to the south, closer to Outlet and Sand Hill here, uh, we can see uh, a little bit more of this background elevated activity, right? Not so much here at Sand Hill, but maybe more so at this Outlet station where maybe you see some tremor associated with movement of magma through that underground fracture that's likely been what the earthquakes are showing us right uh, as a crack opens for magma to fill that spot that's what an intrusion is then you see all the earthquakes that accompany the ground cracking to allow that that to happen so and then the fact that trimmer this back and forth up and down may well just be the the movement vibrating through an open passageway already just moving through there whether it's the the magma itself, or sometimes gas, can have that signal, although we're not detecting gas at Kilauea's surface uh, changing right now. So we'll move on from the seismographs here, but I wanted to share that with you guys. Here's a, a plot from a Swanson paper uh, discussing the seismic southwest rift connector right through here. The southwest rift has this deeper section right through here that uh, fed an eruption most recently, recently 1974, right through here. Um, but there can be many intrusions in this area just as easily as eruptions. And in fact, this area has a lot more intrusions than it has eruptions. A lot, a lot of it doesn't make it to the surface nearly as often. There's a shallow southwest rift over here, which is connects to the Great Crack further southwest. This is not the area we're talking about. It's more this detached area to the south that seismically activates. Right? So this is an area that has showed earthquake activity elevated for several months now, along with the east rift connector over here. But interestingly, what's happened is uh, uh, the East Rift has essentially quieted off, and we see the activity happening really in this upper part right through here of that seismic southwest rift connector. So we'll reference that in the future here if we have any questions coming up for that. Here are earthquake rates and depths for the past month. Actually, just the rates here. Earthquakes per day on the left. This is 200 at the top, zero at the bottom, and uh, one month along the the x-axis here. So here is the beginning of our event yesterday. We reached maybe 175 earthquakes per day yesterday. We can see we're climbing up here today and today we'll have a similar higher peak in the end. We'll see how that, but these will be two higher peaks here that are higher than anything we've seen in the past of the month. You can see it's been variable. We had last week uh, a period of elevated earthquakes along a whole summit and up reef Rift connector. Um, it quieted down a little bit, picked back up a little bit, quieted down a little bit before it really ramped up here. That's the, the pattern over the last month. Um, looking at the tilt meters here, this is a USGS deformation page. At the summit at Wikahuna, we are seeing an increase in tilt here coming in, and perhaps that lar one of those larger earthquakes registering a change in the tilt meter as well. But really, over the last week, you can see the variations uh, in the, the plot, uh, maybe obscure this signal a little bit here because it's, it's pretty hard to see and separate let's call it just that signal right there from any of these other bumps that are happening previous to that so that's really not the clearest station we'll look at sand hill here in a second um, over the past month you can see that really overall after a long steady inflation we seem to reach a, a period where we weren't inflating anymore whether we couldn't inflate or didn't inflate that's uh, something we can dig into in the future, but in any case, it stopped inflating as much and was showing variations.
but overall uh, hadn't kept up the previous trend. The GPS is hard to tell because the GPS uh, plots on the web page of the USGS have been offline here for a little over two weeks now. Um, so we can't quite tell what's happening, although all the reports from USGS is that inflation had continued on a GPS as well. It's just written in the text in the reports. So I just wanted to mention that as we as we don't have as much GPS data as we would like. Um, but we do have these other tilt meters. This is a sand hill. And here I'll zoom in to this last portion on the right. Let's look at the scale first, right? This is 0, 10 microradians, 20 microradians, 30. This is a big scale here. Right? These are 10 microradian chunks, whereas for example, here at the Wikahuna one, we're looking at 0, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6. So we're seeing something changing, but it's it's very, very small in magnitude compared to what we're seeing here at Sand Hill, right? 10, 20, 30. And scrolling over here to the right, you can see that we've jumped up uh, 10, maybe 20-ish microradians and still climbing, still ongoing. We haven't plateaued or changed anything yet. So this is a still developing situation. We'll see. It could easily just fill that crack and uh, accommodate all its pressure for now in that area underground, or it could be that it can't actually accommodate all the pressure. And this could progress into an eruption um, in the summit area as well. That's another possibility still on the table. All right, we'll keep going through the signals here fairly quickly. If we look at the SO2 plots, uh, there is not any new data uh, from the ma manual measurements here. The most recent one, you can see that was between 15 and 55 tons per day back on the 12th, perhaps, um, of August. So not quite two weeks ago, but everything in the last month has been bet in between 85 and 50 tons per day. So all f still within a background level there. Nothing really uh, uh, very indicative. And if we... Let's reload this to make sure we have this as well. If we look at this ambient air SO2 concentrations around a kilo air for the past month, you can see there's been some variation and a couple of spikes, um, but nothing definitively suggesting that there has been a long-term increase in gas emissions. So it seems like whatever is happening underground it has not have, does not have a pathway to the surface for the gas to come out, even through the re recent eruption site. Right? We're not, just not, not detecting it up there. Um, so if we look at other information for the month here let's look let's come back up here and i want to show you guys this pattern of earthquakes for the last month as a point of comparison you can see here is that seismic southwest rift had been active for quite a while showing up here as well but so was the east rift right this upper east rift zone slash east rift connector was also flaring off um, but perhaps this is part of that main magma chamber and when we're seeing more activity over the last week or so along the southern edge, that might have been our first giveaway um, that that was the area that, that was to be suspect. And so zooming into the past week here as a point of comparison, a little bit in this upper southeast rift, uh, up, yeah, um, upper east rift zone here, um, but not nearly the level of before. And you can see much more of these bigger events here marking almost in this line here along the southern caldera margin, right, thing like that, and then connecting to the southwest rift connector a little bit further and we're out to 807 earthquakes during the last week now just just uh, from right now okay, so that's the last week and we'll wait to see as how, how those patterns develop here so for the past year uh, you can see that our last couple weeks here came in um, I'm going to show you guys a scale here earthquakes per week on the left this is 600 is about our, our benchmark perhaps so you can see that we were coming at around 600 per week. We had reached that point once before in June, um, prior to, to any um, more imminent activity. Um, but you can see that that was uh, a point that we reached. And we'll have to wait and see. We can see just in a couple of days here, this skinniest little graph on the right is already reaching levels. So it's going to climb up here, and it may, it may well exceed. And we'll see how high this actually goes um, as our week progresses. And that gets tallied all the rest of the way here. Right, but I showed you guys 800 per week on this plot would come up to here right now. Right? So zooming back out, you can see 800 would have been right there. That's approaching the level of what we were seeing prior to the uh, intrusion that we had back in, in very end of November, earliest December 2020. That was about two and a half weeks prior to the eruption at the summit that happened right through there. And we've had these higher levels for two, three weeks before it actually popped out 
December 20th the last time. So it may be, we may be having similar activity. We'll have to wait and see. Um, but that's the level of background we had before that was comparable now. And then that spike of intrusion that happened back then, we might have a similar one come up here as this actually plots out over the rest of the week here. So we'll wrap it up pretty quick here, um, but I want to point out a couple other things. Here's a plot from the USGS monitoring page, which gives us a, uh, gives us a chance to actually do a, a cross section um, through here and maybe get a little bit, little bit better resolution than we have on those automatic plots. So here you can see uh, for that area, this is the path, past month now, right? We're actually at minus two kilometers. Let's see if I can zoom this in some. So this is minus two kilometers. This is halfway back to sea level. Uh, above back above sea level, here's sea level, and then down, right? So this is really that upper five kilometers that's zoomed in. And you can see that we've had a couple of different events here that flared off um, back. This is in early August, August 5th perhaps, August 9th and 10th perhaps, right? That were similar flare-ups, we'll call them right here, that didn't quite reach the level of what we see now in this orange stripe right through here, which is what's happened in the last last day here. And as you can see, um, really, the, the, there's a, a cluster right here and a couple events off to the side. So a couple of them are deeper that are large, a couple of small ones, a couple of shallower, but most of mostly they're following, following in the range right through here, slightly above this line and slightly below that line. So scrolling over here, slightly above sea level to slightly below two kilometers, right? That's a fairly narrow, tight zone right through there. So interesting, it's not that deeper area. Um, one question that might come up is because is that that area of the South Caldera is near that South Caldera Reservoir. Um, that South Caldera Reservoir, that deep, deep magma chamber of the volcano, is thought to be down in a range of three to five kilometers or so. So this is why this is useful. Three to five kilometers plots down here, that's where that magma chamber would actually be. And you can see that this zone does have some adjustments, but this is not where the activity is focused. It's not focused down here by the magma chamber. It's focused above it. In the area above it in the seismic southwest rift area right that's just one little nuance we can pull out from here okay so just real quick i wanted to just flip through some of these uh, um, time automatic time lapses of, of the webcams here the thermal is showing the same kind of psychedelic color as the gases but really there's no increase in temperature and you see black there's no glow no glow no glow let's maybe reload this so we can get some current views as well here and this might take a second there's a lot of webcams on here but you see there's no sign of gas no sign of glow at the summit um, even during the, the nighttime frames of these 24-hour animations you can see the moon came up a very bright nearly full perhaps full moon depending on your definition and otherwise, everything is quiet. No, no glow on the webcams. Just want to make sure we go there. There's the East Rift. No glow in the East Rift. No extra gas. Nothing unusual happening anywhere down there. A couple of lights happening down here at the power plant. But nothing unusual happening across there. All right, and I believe with that we will uh, switch to a discussion period here. And some thank yous. Yeah. Yep. Um, so we do have a good amount of donations I want to acknowledge, um, and we appreciate everybody that's coming through the Super Chat or on hawaiitracker.com slash support. So let's get through those real quick. I appreciate everybody. We did have a $25 Super Chat from our friend Gary. Um, one second, I'm pulling everything up. Gary Bryan, $25. Uh, we have a $4.99 Super Chat. It says uh, I need to adjust my mic level a little bit. Uh, I'll work on that. And we have a $20 super chat from Laura Todd it says, thanks for bringing these, bringing these uh, breaking news. And who else we got? Oh, we had on the last stream before it crashed, we had uh, Chippy Neal with a 10 euro super chat and Natasha with a $5 super chat. Appreciate everybody there. We also had some uh, people making donations on whitetracker.com. Want to acknowledge them. Laura B, James P., Mel S, Elizabeth W, Joni H, uh, Brenda P, and Jaroslav R, Barbara R. Appreciate everybody. 
And we do have a few questions here. If anybody wants to drop any more questions, I'll try and check the chat while we're doing this. First question is about just uh, kind of what I is reoccurring. Um, does how does the if this were to erupt again uh, today, would it be considered a new eruption at that point? And what would be the arguments? Uh, why would it be? considered a new eruption or why wouldn't it be all right i'll uh, i'll see if i can address that while you check on your mic there i'm not sure if the sound levels are a little bit messed up here yeah. on the on the broadcast because of our starting and stop so mahalo you guys for sticking with us with after a couple fall starts here but yeah so it's a good question today does mark the three month uh deadline we'll call it that usgs set they actually said august 24th and really, that's an arbitrary definition. They're following the the Smithsonian's guidelines there, you know, 90 days or three months. You know, I think it might be slightly more than 90 days technically, but um, uh, it really is falls in that gray zone, right? You know, you could certainly argue for the reps today that it's just, especially if the reps in that area um, near where it came out before, you would say, yeah, that's something we should certainly consider maybe bending the rule a little bit now and calling it a resumption of that eruption but let's say it migrates further further away from the summit and erupts somewhere else in that case you might be able to to, to invoke the location component and say like well it's a little bit too far away it's actually slightly different in its nature or character and we might call it an eruption based on that so there's 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 still a judgment call right they're kind of just trying to use a guideline it's not written in stone anywhere that it's officially has to be called this or that or the other thing they're just trying to find something consistent um to go by right yeah. Kind of creates a standard to work off of. Yeah, yeah. At least um, gives us a point of discussion, right? Right. And you know, and it's right. it's, it's worth noting that you know the whole pool era, uh, that thirty-five year eruption. You know, there were sixty-two episodes, right? And there are lots of pauses that happen in between them. Um, usually only a few weeks, uh, not usually not three months kind of thing. But you know that, that they can happen a lot, and you can have eruptions from Pu'o to Nepal, uh, over to Kamoa, over to Kapaynaha, and have it all be called the same eruption. Right. Mm, right. So um, as for my mic level, why don't we go ahead and put the OBS all the way up for my mic and I'll just check it on the, the live stream and see if it's working. Um, so the next question is uh, I've seen this question a couple times, so I'm going to try and paraphrase everybody's one. Uh, what swarms or intrusions were similar to this current one and do they lead generally towards an eruption? Like, are they a precursor? to uh eruptive activity uh they they can be but they are not always right you know um you have so it really varies on a time period of the volcano and its eruptive pattern it can change over different periods of time and it has over different decades right but you, you certainly can have a lot of intrusions without eruptions and especially in the southwest rift area where i think it was i forget which paper we were looking at the statistics whether it was klein or whether it was uh uh, whose whose paper that, uh, we're looking at statistics of eruptions um in the summit southwest rift southeast rift etc oh, right right and the southwest rift uh only one percent of the 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 magma that intrudes that area makes it to the surface right whereas you know most of it intrudes underground in the southwest rift rather than erupt so in the southwest rift that's more common to happen um in the east rift it's a little bit different as well and of course that can change over time maybe that maybe that's where i should leave it mm -hmm. Um, that works. We the, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I can I can mention that the 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 previous activity on December second ish, twenty twenty. Um, I can pull it up at some point here. But that that intrusion was thought to have occurred somewhere underneath this part of the volcano, right through there, right. So it's not too far off from there, actually. It is it is more outside the caldera a little bit. I think I think it's starting to. If you look at this outer caldera fault line more or less through here we're getting near the edge but we're maybe starting to maybe starting to cross that boundary right there mm. borderline you know within within an error of locations these earthquakes we'll have to wait and see what the science says so one question i have or continuation on that one is the december 2nd intrusion we talked about it as a failed eruption mm -hmm. would this uh, also be considered a failed eruption or all intrusions considered failed eruptions or what's that yeah that's like? that's we yeah, i mean that's just how i personally refer to them there may, maybe someone refers to them that way also i'm not sure that's like an official 
okay. officially endorsed kind of term, right? That's just the, how I, I think of it, right? The magma is trying to make it out because of excess pressure. And if it gets to the surface, this eruption, if it doesn't, it's called an intrusion. But really, it's the same process ultimately, and it's, and it's both relieving that deeper pressure in, in, a, in a volcano. So s flipping it to our perspective as humans and really just caring whether it erupts or not, right? You know, then um, in perspective of, of an eruption, an intrusion is, is magma that didn't quite make it to the surface, but went through that same process, right? So that's why I like to call it a failed eruption. And it's, I think it's, it evokes the process a little easier for people. Right, the common person, yeah. So yeah, I would I would at this point call that a failed eruption, but it's still kind of ongoing. So it maybe hasn't all the way failed yet, and that's the that's why I wouldn't necessarily jump on it mm -hmm. yet, right? And just to follow up on that, you know, once again, it took two and a half weeks uh, in December last year for it to reprime to erupt, and so right. we'll wait and see how long it takes. You know, it, it it could be a short process. It could happen within hours if it's a bit of a pressure that's coming from deeper down. Or it right. could take weeks again, or it could take months again. You know, we'll have to wait and see. One of the interesting things to me, at least, is on these, since it is like a failed eruption, the pressure is getting the, the magma to move uh, vertically. All we need is just that little bit extra to get it over the top. Uh, but I can't, I can't remember where I was going with that. <laughs> um, well, part of it, too, is that that whole area that's extending the Kua'e, you know, if you haven't checked out our our, our stream highlights on the Kua'e and the Southwest Rift, it's uh, applicable to what's happening now. Um, but that area is extending, so you have a lot, it, it, it's not like you have as much pressure mm -hmm. holding the cracks together. So it's easier to fill in those areas underground without having to pinch it off and build enough pressure to actually squeeze it out right. to the surface, right? The Kua'e erupts very, very rarely. Um, it has, we, we talked about the, the eruptions of the document documented on there but very very rarely even so um much more likely it's in filling that area and that stuff like the caldera as part of that expansion process of the, of the south flank and caldera and the whole the whole dynamic of the volcano we just had a question come through asking that are, are eruptions in the area of the earthquake swarm uh common yeah so, so it's yeah uncommon although the most recent eruption on the southwest rift in 1974 did occur there Mm -hmm. So you know, if there's anything, um, if there's anything that recency tells you, like maybe it's more likely to happen there, maybe maybe not. That's something to consider. It was seventy four. It's a long time ago already. Time for everything to re re heal and harden everything else. Right. I think all I was gonna say uh, that I lost my train of thought was that the the intrusion creates just that little bit of pressure relief. So then it needs to repressurize just that amount that it, the amount of space that it created today in order to erupt again. So it's it relieved a little bit of pressure, but not all that much, right? In the yeah. grand scheme of things. Yeah. So it just depends. And if you if you imagine a magma chamber being this body that's say two kilometers tall, right? And then right. how if you imagine a pressure gradient in there, right? How much pressure have you built up? At the, how much head have you built up at the top of the thing? Is it just a little bit where you just push out the one little crack and that's enough, or is there a much deeper part of it where that first part just opens the pathway and then the deeper pressure comes out and it intensifies and builds over time? That's what I don't know, and what we what's hard to tell without with, without having, better, you know, um, GPS would be useful. You know, the Instar might be interesting. You know, um, we just really have to wait for USGS to tell us more information, right? We're just seeing and really speculating here what's what's possibly happening from the the very limited public publicly available data. Pardon my piano. Uh donated $25 in a super chat says thank you so much for the info been watching your streams for three years now mahalo uh, thank you for the donation appreciate everybody mahalo, um, mahalo. and just for those that can't make monetary donations uh if you do want to support the stream best way to do that is just like subscribe and consider sharing this on your social media platforms it really helps get this type of information out there get more viewers it really does help in the grand scheme um yeah, I believe. Let me check questions again. We have one. These are kind of reoccurring questions that we get more commonly, not uh, specifically towards this eruption or this intrusion, rather. Um, Dave from Facebook asked uh, about the ways to track the magma movement underground, uh, wondering if seismic refraction or something like that can be used to model in real time the uh, magma bodies as they move. Uh, do we have the tech today for that kind of stuff? 
Yeah, so so the, the, I mean the the fundamental thing to to understand is that uh, the magma itself, the liquid magma itself, is not generating earthquakes, right? It's just it's able to move without without that brittle failure, right? It's the margins of where the magma is moving that you see those earth, earthquakes happening, and when it's intruding into an area that that has to open a crack or widen a crack or that kind of thing. So you can track the edges of the activity, and it's harder to do that in real time because uh, you you analyze the earthquakes mostly independently as they come in automatically. Whereas if you're analyzing the whole population as a whole after the fact, uh, you can then increase your precision and your locations to then and your resolution, right? And kind of focus into the actual, actual structures that are activating. Um, the details at this point in time uh, are not as important. Those are something that usually gets done after the fact as a science is, is catching up. At this point, I'm more worried about are there signs that might come to the surface somewhere? And um, if so, approximately where we don't have to know to the exact meter, we can know to the nearest, you know, 500 meters would be good enough at this point in time, right? If it's going to do that, that, that kind of thing. So uh, it, right. it, is, it is possible, you know, um, to, to, to analyze that, right? But um, that, that's something that it's you know, it's, it's hard to do in a real time, um, or if it is done in real time, it's not shown publicly in real time. Yeah, and that's why we right. rely on the tilt meters and the the other you know uh, GPS stations and INSAR when we have it, and you know uh, gravity data when we have it, et cetera, et cetera. All right. There is a good question that came across here from Diana, who says, uh, who asks. With the magma in the lava lake still being liquefied uh, from the December eruption, how likely is it the pressure or earthquakes could compromise the plug, allowing it to drain back into the shallow magma system beneath the caldera? Well, I'm not sure how much void space there is over there um, for it to drain back into, but it certainly can tilt it and disrupt it, and there is definitely the molten stuff in there, so it possibly could do something interesting. Let's look at the, the plot of depth here with, on the lava lake surface. And overall, it hasn't changed a whole lot, right? Remember, this scale here is in meters. This is 10 centimeters between these hash marks. And so you see, it was doing this interesting wiggle before. And we speculated that this might be something to do with the ground tilting around there as pressure was building close to the eruption. This is something we hadn't seen before, these, these two wiggles. First time we've seen this post-eruption. So that was maybe an indication that it was getting getting primed right there and actually if you look here you can see that um, we're holding pretty steady and if anything maybe slightly rising like swelling right maybe not that the magma itself is is getting pushed in there but the whole thing is lifted up as a whole from below um, slightly upwards right um, in that area relative to where the the rangefinder is right that's in between those two areas right they're not lifting up to exactly the same rate or you wouldn't see that change necessarily so you're seeing the difference in that in the in the rate of that range find, finder lifting and that lava lake lifting there which is interesting too so um definitely fascinating stuff there yeah um but yeah um we we could if it were to tip enough you know it, it could be that it cracks open and then oozes out that's a possibility for sure um i don't i don't know as that i would expect it to drain as much right you know like if 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 i mean it, 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 it is worth considering right if if the southwest rift opens enough that the intrusion can feed it feed that area and you have a net loss of magma from the summit and the ground underneath the lava lake starts now dropping and subsiding then you maybe could induce some kind of collapse after that, right? That's something something that occurred back in 1960, um, following the Kapoho eruption. As magma left the summit Kapoho, and it, it several weeks later uh, began collapsing at the summit and caused an old crusted over lava lake to start oozing down into the crack that 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 formed. Right, so that certainly can happen. It's happened before. Right, so um, but I don't yeah. believe that there was void space per se. At least not mm -hmm. yet. Not until you move magma out of, out of there. Yeah. All right. Um, Tammy asks, is there a way to determine the 
supply rate of the magma coming into the system currently at Kilauea? It's it's difficult. Uh, it's certainly doable. I mean, doable. I and mean, the USGS has a lot more information, and we'll just have to wait to, to hear. You know, perhaps mm -hmm. this week's volcano watch, right? You know, so for example, the volcanic gases are one thing that you can look at. Right, SO two comes out when a magma is coming pretty shallow, and we haven't detected any increase in SO two as we showed you guys already. Um, CO two comes out deeper, right? So the CO two gives you the longer term rate. We haven't heard anything about the CO two measurements um, in a long time and we haven't heard anything about the co2 to so2 ratio which tells you something about how young the magma comes in the surface whether it's coming whether it's fresh stuff from deeper down or a buildup of shallower stuff we haven't heard anything about that since the beginning of the, of the eruption in 2020 as well so that's still to be determined and information something they certainly uh, have some information about we don't have any any to to share to, to let you know uh, what that might be tracking right and even though, even so, there's there is some question of how much resolution do you have in the short term? Can you can you see variations, really, day to day or, or hour to hour or week to week? Or really, can you only see it month to month or longer? You know, mm -hmm. yeah, that's something that's that's hard to hard to untangle. Right. Seeing this question reappear a couple times, uh, go ahead and address it. It's uh, about the recent deep Bahala activity and does it relate to the shallow summit earthquakes now no it doesn't re doesn't relate directly they're both part of the overall really big volcanic plumbing system but the Bahala is not much deeper offset part of it and we're not, you know and that kind of feeds into to the shallower part and they act independently by and large Bahala earthquakes were happening before this when this summit activity is over they'll probably keep happening and it's basically a separate independent thing, right? It, that does relate in the sense that it is tracking movement of magma through the system, but it takes a long time to get down from 20 miles down and 20 miles to the Southwest over to the shallow summit region. Right. Well, I believe that does it for the questions for today. We're trying to keep this kind of a shorter update. We will be back on Tuesday, uh, Thursday, unless something happens and we will go live again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. This it may maybe that it takes takes uh, uh, that it slows down or it progresses a little bit. You know, we will um, also be issuing uh, text updates, so you can check HawaiiTracker.com for those. We may issue those more frequently than we than we go live. We will go live if something major changes uh, between now and Thursday. Otherwise, we will be back with you guys on Thursday evening at five p.m. Hawaiian time. Right. Yep. Until then, I will sign off and pass it to you. Yeah, he's Dane DuPont. I'm Philip Ong. Aloha, everyone.